So do they mute while I do that? Yeah, they're both muted now. Okay, um, how wonderful. Um, good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for coming. It's lovely to see you all. I can't really wave personally. That's the tragedy of Zoom. You can't really wink at people. Uh, anyway, welcome. Um, my name is Sasha Craddock, and I am with Ingrid Swenson, co-president of IECA UK. And even though this might be obvious uh, to many of you, I would like to explain what the International Associations of Art Critics is, and especially because we're welcoming members and also non-members. And it's important just to explain that the IECA, and this is IECA UK obviously, is a voluntary membership organisation which brings together over 4,000 art writers and professionals from some 70 countries. And uh, our aim is very straightforward, but in these times, it's important to state very obvious things. I've learned that. So our aim is to promote art criticism as a discipline, to protect the ethical and professional interests of our members, to maintain an active international, international membership, to encourage face-to-face -face encounters like this one, using as much technology as we can, we're getting rather good at this, um, but mainly to stimulate professional relationships across political, geographical, eth ethical, economic and religious boundaries, to defend freedom of expression and to oppose arbitrary censorship. Okay, straight up, but terribly important. These things need to be said. I'm really thrilled that we are able to welcome Sheila Hicks in conversation with Sarah Wilson. And this will last for not even a whole hour. And I'm really excited because it in no way is one of those slideshows where people are saying, how big is it and what's it made of? But it's going to be an active participatory tour of Sheila's studio in Paris. And as Sarah said, she has incredible stuff. And we're going to hear um, about the work and about their particular relationship. I'm not going to give any more introduction, but I'm excited. All I can say is, please, can you mute your machines? Or yeah, audio. Mute your audio. So absolutely, it is only our stars and our tonight's guests and stars that we have. So thank you. Over to you two. I look forward to it. So Sheila, you're peering through a masterpiece or a mistress piece, of course, and thinking about this talk yesterday and muddling it in my head with the title of uh, the documentary in Castle Learning from Athens, I thought that for me, we should have a title for this uh, conversation called Learning from Sheila Hicks, because I learn so much from you all the time and you are really like the goddess Athena in many ways, but Sheila, you had yourself um, an alternative title for this conversation. Would you like to tell us where we are and how that relates to your title? You remind me what the title was? It was visiting the site where the guillotine was invented in the Cour de Rouen. And you were going to tell us more about where we actually are hosting this conversation. The Cour de Rouen in the CZM arrondissement in Paris, uh, not it's sort of halfway between the Académie Française and the Jardin Luxembourg, not too far from the Théâtre de l'Odéon, Boulevard Saint-Germain. It's on everybody's um, touristic track in Paris, except it's a hidden courtyard. It's a hidden courtyard where people like Balthus and Giacometti used to prowl, no, enjoying the same ivy that you enjoy, yes? Balthus, yes, but not Giacometti. Giacometti no. was in a sort of very humble, modest, poor... In Alesia. But he used to come to visit here, perhaps. And then the Institut Giacometti was here for a few years. No, what happened is uh, Giacometti's widow, who became a very rich woman, Annette. <laughs> like many widows of poor artists, um, got involved with a minister of President Mitterrand, who had convinced her to invest her fortune 
into a little space in our courtyard. And now we have the Giacometti Foundation in front of us, which is very intimidating. Who can go to their studio and work in the morning in front of the Giacometti Foundation? It's ridiculous because I came into this courtyard where I am, which is in the Cour de Rouen, with just ghosts, ghosts like Ache, the photographer. Mm. Huh? Uh, people told me ghosts, you know, different people I admired had had sort of modest studios in this courtyard. And I'm not too happy about the idea of working now in the shadow of the Giacometti Foundation. But well, for I, me, it's Sheila Hicks who's in this courtyard. What I like is when I go home at night, and go upstairs, which isn't very far, just up the staircase, I still see the lights burning at night in the Giacometti Foundation. How is it possible? How is it possible that all these people are sitting behind their computers and worried about this dead artist? It's very encouraging to think somebody cares about a dead artist. It is indeed, but I'd just like to say before we launch into other things that you're very much alive. We spent the most extraordinary day together involving a most beautiful lunch in which all Sheila's assistants watched the Courtauld graduation ceremony, which was very strange culturally, I'm sure. But then you've told me during the day, in little dribs and drabs, not only that Brigitte Macron has one of your tapestries in the Elysee, that the Night of Museums, which we could all go to on the 3rd of October, will have an enormous hanging by you linking the Palais de Tokyo and the Musée de la Ville de Paris, that you're exhibiting at this very moment in Sao Paulo with this lovely curator we may quote a little bit later on. Um, called, that, called Pierre, called? Um, you know his name. Luis, Luis. Perez. Aramas. Luis Perez Aramas, who's written a very fabulous essay about you and your encounter with Joseph and Annie Albers. So we'll go back to that in a moment. That's San Paolo. Um, you told me about the most extraordinary group exhibition that nobody knows about yet. This is hot news called Diversity United to be held in the Tretiakov Gallery with a huge rostrum of um, living European artists in which you're going to exhibit, which is opening uh, on the 11th of November, being opened by Vladimir Putin himself as a gesture of love towards Europe, which sounds rather strange. And then uh, on November the 25th, your beautiful installation, which is uh, in the foyer, the libraries and many other spaces of Mac in Vienna is opening. And our dear Hepworth retrospective, which we were all looking forward to so much, has been postponed for a year until sometime in 2021. The but fall. In the in fall, the fall no, of 2021. So you're basically, as you have been ever since I met you, which was in 2007, and Sheila's found the actual wonderful little card where I bumped into you in the Passage de Retz very ignorant at the time in a marvelous exhibition which combined you with an African collection and I saw you by this big tapestry and I said but it couldn't be is it Sheila Hicks because I knew your name because of the exhibition called 72 for 72 in 1972 with 70 blokes and two women you and Nikki de saint Fal. but I suddenly realized that this must be you. And we have been friends and had less or more intense um, moments of intellectual courtyard. discussion. This is my courtyard. That's the courtyard. Seen from a window on the third floor. When I, when, I leave out, when I lean out the window of my living room on the third floor, I can look down in the courtyard and I can spread the things I'm making out in the courtyard while they're being packed sorted out, packed, and documented before they go off. So to think of the life of the courtyard would be extraordinary. And today, when I arrived, there were these huge, beautiful, round things, which we can show you here in the studio. Can you see these lovely round roundels? And you told me, Sheila, can you hear me, I hope, Sasha? You told me that these had been designed initially we, we can't hear you so very well can you get so these beautiful yeah, roundels can you hear me now these beautiful yes, roundels have that one? had been exhibited in a different form 
in the Palace of Versailles and um, have been, then were deconstructed and reconstructed like this. And these are the works that are going to go to the Tretiakov Gallery. And uh, very triumphantly, Sheila here is exhibiting another round work and there are loads more here, as you can see, with a wonderful array of colored bobbins of all colors. And um, comets, satellites, comets, satellites, cultural. Community. And then I had some surprises today because one knows as an art historian that every time you go and see somebody, even if you think you've interviewed them exhaustively, up comes something else. Because they always invent. Artists invent. Don't believe what they say. Don't invent. They invent. Of course, because they're invent. imaginative, and you give them a trampoline. You ask them a question. And the imagination starts spinning. Indeed. So we were trying to think of, of, of names for these. And I was thinking of something to do with tondos, because once upon a time, in a very austere way, Sheila had exhibited a tondo made of white gloves or shirt. And then she suddenly produced her earliest engravings of 1952, made at Yale, in which you can see these big swirls in the sky. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, and I was thinking of Sora and Van Gogh. Sheila was actually learning the craft of engraving at this particular moment. Etching. Etching, whoops, sorry, etching. And sometimes art historians aren't so good on the tape, but I can see the dry print at the back, you can see here. And then later on, Sheila, you suddenly said, and in fact, you can see it here. Look, if I cheat and do this, you said, guess where all my art comes from? And you showed me something in the middle of your beautiful swells that connected with your father you'd never shown me before, which is also circular, which is, extraordinarily enough, a thing to do with ball bearings. And you explained to me how your father, um, who, exotically enough was part Cherokee but was actually in the end the president of an enormous ball bearing company after the war because he had to actually hide piles of ball bearings just in case America was bombed by the Germans or the Japanese during the war and so in some funny way these circular forms in a way that no art historian previously could have deduced has got this enormous relationship that goes right back. Well, I think of these Sheila's as being, I think, if I, I think of myself as being the interior circle, learning to live and work and adapt to the exterior circle. In other words, moving from culture to culture, language to language, project to project, and understanding context, and then beginning to work within that context and figuring how to work and to move concentrically and oppositely and to understand that I am anonymous because I am only the author of something that will become material, material meaning the material that will last beyond my visit and beyond my intervention. So I metaphorically identify with the idea of the movement of ball bearings, which mean a series of concentric contextual and when, in, 19, in 1973, by this time, Sheila was great friends with Monique Levi-Strauss, her best girlfriend, I think, for people who have best girlfriends. I still have best girlfriends. And Monique Levi-Strauss wrote the first book on Sheila Hicks, which English people will be interested to hear was published by Studio Vista in English as well as in French. And picking up on what we've just said, there is this wonderful diagram that Sheila drew of her life, which is also based on all these circles with a few whooshes, some transcontinental whooshes in between them. Um, but maybe if everyone's seen it, you could then look at the diagram, Sheila, and tell us a little bit about how you came to make that diagram of your transcontinental experiences. Uh, usually I'm making this diagram on a paper tablecloth when I'm at dinner with someone and they said to me, how did you get from Hastings, Nebraska to Mexico where you lived for five years? How'd you get to Chile where you went on a, how'd you get to Machu Picchu? How did you get, 
how did you get to Syracuse University, then Yale University? How did you get to Paris, where you've been for 50 years? So I begin with a whatever. On a tablecloth, as one does in Paris, of course. Whatever instrument is handy. I've been trying to just explain visually these movements. And there's no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. It was never planned that I would move from India to Morocco to Cape Town, or that I would have a project, you know, in Tennessee <laughs> or Colorado. I think you've had them in Japan as well, haven't you? Or in Tokyo or in Kyoto. Or in, yes, everywhere. And uh, I would go to the airport and I wouldn't remember where I was going, but they had sent me the ticket. So I would go to the gate and register and go. I only knew that I had a mission. And In fact, I said that Sheila Hicks was the first female frequent flyer artist, which I think is absolutely true. Well, the, what I made and what I was doing was needed. It wasn't superfluous. It was needed by the architects to satisfy their clients. Their clients would commission buildings. And then would come the meetings about, well, now we're going to open it, and now we're going to inhabit it, and now we're going to work in it. How can we make it livable? And then the architects would come up with this scheme. Why don't we ask this lady in Paris, <laughs> <laughs> who seems to be into making things, uh, I won't say cozy, but livable and, and uh, agreeable to uh, inhabit. Why don't we go ask her if she has any ideas? And that's how I got involved in this project in Saudi Arabia of doing King Saud University, Riyadh, when a Japanese architect, Gyo Obata, came to see me, spread out the plans on the floor of my living room here in Paris, and said, what would you do if, and then showed me all these buildings. He knew I had lived, I've lived and worked frequently in Morocco in the 80s. So I understood the Islamic culture a bit. And yet I also understood some of the no-nos, what to avoid. Um, and after I gave him some suggestions of what I thought would be good in uh, King Saud University, in Riyadh, he asked me, will you come along with me and make the presentation? And I said, well, how am I gonna do that? And he said, give me your passport. And he got me a visa within three days. And off we went, and I worked for three years, almost three years on that project. Learned a lot about the Islamic culture, of course, and working with all men. Yeah, but there was one thing where you had 12,000 um, artisans, artists, and engineers, and you were the only woman, I remember. Well, there was New York Times. That was New York Times, <laughs> but nonetheless. But I think that's interesting, because you, you haven't... Um, in the most evident way, if one compares you with someone like Eva Hesse, ticked feministy boxes. And yet, in terms of the strength of your career and where you've been and what you've done. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. Yes. To, my pleasure is not to seek celebrity, but to seek anonymity. Yeah, and to seek work. Which is a passport. Anonymity is a passport. Yes. Which enables you to travel and work in all kinds of situations and contexts. Absolutely. Uh, what was I going to say just then? Um, I, oh, I know what I was going to say, because when, um, when uh, Sheila, you talked just now about uh, working with these architects and them asking you to do interiors and so forth, there's a wonderful trajectory that goes back even further. There's this trajectory in three stages, which I think is interesting for people to understand, that goes from a Peruvian textile to Yale and your thesis on Peruvian textiles and can hop to Knoll. I think, think people in England at least know the K-N-O-L-L, -L, where that Peruvian textile... Um, um, the technology, the, te the, the technolo vocabulary. And yeah, and a certain kind of look suddenly becomes modern, becomes cool. Well, you becomes... know, it's, uh, that's where people make a mistake. They get involved in iconography. I wasn't, I didn't say anything iconographical. Good for you, because you see, people easily are taken in by images, yes. iconography, what does it mean, pictorial. The forte of the Incaic, pre-Incaic cultures were not only the images and the uh, shapes and colors, 
it was the structures, the very sophisticated and very complex structures that they used to make things. And that fascinated engineers. Mm, oh, the, most complex, the most complex textile compos uh, compositions structurally that we've been able to trace in all of the history of textiles. With Peru. Is the pre incaic textiles. Now that interested me and I did a thesis about it at Yale with George Kubler. Um, little did I know that it would take me to Machu Picchu because they gave me a Fulbright grant to go and take a look at this area in the Andes where these textiles were made. I went as a painter where I was working at Yale. I had one degree in painting. They sent me down to teach in the Universidad Católica in Santiago in Chile, which meant I could turn in my ticket, which was an air ticket, and go by land, which I did. I went to Venezuela and then traveled all through South America by land and going through the Andes and going through and discovering all of these textile cultures through the Andes, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador. You took some photos then yourself, didn't you? Lots of photos. You were with Serge Laurent, who was a, quite a celebrated photographer, who was the um, key show at the Arles Photo um, Festival in, I think, 2013. But you took your own photos of the same motifs, and obviously we, it was a revelation. We had two cameras. We, had, yes. we traveled with four cameras, and we passed them around. And we took little North American trainers, you know, planes up into up into the glaciers and ventisqueros and things down in Punta Arenas and down in the Estrecho de Magallanes, Magallanes, Magallanes. We went to areas where people were mapping territories and convinced people in these planes that had plexiglass noses to take us up into the air so we could do nose dives and photograph. I knew you did photographs, but not nose dives. <laughs> Through the <laughs> cockpits. So you did nose dives. And we could take, you know, aerial <laughs> photographs. Now we've got, what are they called? They're wonderful. The cameras that go up by themselves. Um, it's drones. <laughs> yeah. So this is pre, pre drone. Sheila and Serge Laurent doing nose dives into Machu Picchu. Well, we were lifting up and trying to get aerial shots from different angles. Uh, but now, of course, the easy out is. Is the drone and it's not so dangerous, but not quite so exciting. There must have been a lot of adrenaline going on, I think, at that moment. But uh, visually seeing things from that angle too gives you ideas for composition mm. and for bas relief. Mm. So a lot of things I do have to do with bas relief, mm. not just flat. Yes, no, but, always, always there's this huge idea, which I've never used that sculptural term bas relief instead of um, thinking just of texture, of texture mm -hmm. in textiles, but you're absolutely right. There is that, that uh, and even that aerial idea, I think one, one, one looks again at some of these big, I well, mean, like this thing, look, this one here, I'm if I may it. touch one. Yeah. You can actually see that as an aerial shot rather than a... Can you show me with the yeah. hand? Here, take We're this. going for a walk again. This is, look at this. Can you see this? Talk a bit louder, Sheila. Can you see this? I hope because, you know, are you in it? Are you behind it? Are you in front of it? It's endless. It can go on. Someone says, I happen to have a wall. It's 45, 45 what? 45 feet? 45 metros. Met. Meters. Meters. Okay, 45. Can you do it? 45. Why not? Well, we've got another place in the building that's about 450 feet. No, meters. Can we go on? Can we make some of these things? <laughs> can we keep going and change the colors as we go? Can we imagine it three meters high? Can we go up three stories? Can we go up 30 meters? Like Embarcadero Center? in San Francisco? Or can we, why does it have to be white? Can we have color? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Come closer. And up from up to down. Up to down. There we go. Now, so this way of working is for me bas relief and it starts to border on sculpture. Start to border on environment. It starts to border on 
performance too, because it's movable. You can be in it, out of it, in front of it, in back of it. Absolutely. I remember you said once that you walked through um, Soto's Penetrable when you were in Venezuela, those hanging sculptures made by Jesus Rafael Soto. And I felt that very much at your exhibition in Alison Jake's gallery, when again you told me about, I can't remember the name of the piece, but what I wanted to say was, Sheila, is that when you were not just on that particular incredibly long and important trip, but in general, you also kept marvelous notebooks and also, I didn't have anyone to talk to when you're traveling like that. Sometimes, but also <laughs> you made these lovely things, which I think, this is this wonderful monograph again with a very Hicksy bookmark. You made these little experimental pieces that are like prayers or daily exercises or, or um, a pianist scales. And yet, for each one, you would always write a very poetic little description. Well, I never, uh, I, people say, what's the title? I, well, I don't know what the title is. Well, how can you remember it if you give it a number? A lot of people just give numbers to their work. I would try and think of something, I close my eyes and think of, if I had to describe it and remember it, what do I remember about? What would be an identification, a passport? And so um, I just opened this book at random. And for most of us who are familiar with Yale University Press, Yale doesn't do these kind of bizarre, thick, beautiful books, but there's a whole book of these. It's like a kind of Sheila Hicks this Bible. This book's in its fifth printing. It's in its fifth printing. But you have to remember that Yale refused it. Yale refused it. In the beginning. They but this it. is a very popular woman. This is in no its fifth way. printing. <laughs> and talking about one of your studios, this is called Rue des Marronniers which must be very near. It's and the this, street on which my friend lives. This is the street that Monique Levi-Strauss lived on. And just to read you this little one, it says, natural dark alpaca walk, um, holds chestnut brown, purple, crimson rose, and beige wefts. Woven patches alternate with openings. I fabricate Monique Levi-Strauss's portrait, stitching discontinuous memories tales of journeys and mishaps that she meticulously assembles in her book on my work. So that's a very lovely portrait tribute. In fact, when I looked at these before, and I had my favorites in the past, but I can't see where they've all gone. I don't know if you want to choose another one. I just um, opened it around. I never ever thought of them as portraits, but this idea of a diary practice is very lovely. So here's another one, a much pinker, lighter pink one opened at random and maybe Sheila it would be much more poetic if you read your little text um, for it which all salvages finished that's a very short do you know what salvages are yes I certainly do to stop things fraying ask any guy you're having dinner with if he knows what a salvage is they don't and they don't know the names of any plants or leaves or trees either here's another one now, which is this one? What does this say? This is called, ah, oh, this is to do with Germany. Eglantine Straat, no, Eglantine Holland. Street. Holland. Oh, Holland, sorry, yes. Amsterdam. Yeah, I didn't read the top bit properly, the Straat bit, otherwise it would have been Straße, wouldn't it? This says stiff, dark green paper and fragments of handwoven silk enter a network of orange apricot and emerald warps. They squeeze in like houses along the Amsterdam canals. Rudimentary stitching holds the teeming block together. So in one way, this isn't like a portrait, but a photograph of an Amsterdam landscape. And today when I came in, Sheila, your lovely son Christabel was there, and I was going to give a lecture in Amsterdam, and it was going to be called Christabel's Trapeze. Christobel. Christobel's <laughs> Trapeze, because Christabel, who, whose father was Venezuelan. No, Chilean. Oh, sorry, Chilean. Sorry, whoops, that was a big, big mistake. Fall we fall. have been <laughs> talking about Chile as well. Cristobal, Cristobal. Cristobal's okay. trapeze was the name of a huge Liana-like installation that was in the entrance to the Stedelijk Museum for, I think, some decades even. 
And because I was asked to give a lecture at the State League, I was going to make it about Sheila in general because I desired to, but in particular because it would be a complement to this very large work in the State League collection, which commemorated Cristobal, who came over and made a film about your Alison Jake's um, gallery show. And um, we had lovely time plunging our hands into your um, Riviere piece. Well, the reason it was called uh, the Trapeze de Cristobal yes. was because he and his friends came from school in the afternoon. And would swing on your pieces. And, they and, and we were making it and they'd climb from the, the floor up to the loggia, the balcony in the studio, and they could use it like a fireman's escape, but like a fireman rope, and they would climb up and down. They were, of course, they're all six, seven, eight years but old. But weren't you cross with them? No, this was great. You were just a tolerant mother who loved no, everything. No, this was great because it activated it and made it into something uh, that uh, became part of their lives. Yeah. And, they, and they'd come down, they'd go up on their loggia, and they would come and slide down and hold on to it and grip it. And so when people would ask, whatever happened to that thing that used to be hanging here, I'd say, oh, you mean La Trapeze de Cristobal? Oh, I see. <laughs> so that memory of being able and being permitted, because as you know, we're not normally allowed to touch things, plunging my hands into something. Maybe we could look at this because it's quite similar to your um, Peche dans la rivière. <gasps> but Alison, can I touch it or not? Try and see if you can do it without it falling apart. Well, no, no, no I'm not going to let it fall apart. I would never. But this is a beautiful wave. It is part of a major work being posted to America today, correct? I hope. <laughs> Not another mistake on my part. Yes, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, this sure. is a good idea. And this is the concept of the work just coming up. But this is exactly the same thing with a foin sticking into it. I mean, these are these big um, um, metal pieces sticking in. So it is a development. It's not a metal piece. It's a compass. A compass. But it is very similar to that foin well, sticking Well, it's a compass into... like they'd use to construct Notre Dame, to be able to measure stone. Oh, gosh. Unbelievable. You know, Notre Dame's on the mend. Thank goodness. Yes, I know. It's as it was it's before happening. as well. Huh? Yeah. We're very happy. But uh, with these kind of gigantic, can you bring the compass? So this is an installation in your courtyard as an experiment before the same piece goes to America or... Or, or it's just one of a series of oh, working with... Oh my God, isn't it beautiful? Yeah, Look at this beautiful compass just coming up. That's isn't that so superb? Let's see how we can do it. Oh yes. Can you see this? Yeah. It's a way to measure. It's like a, it's like a compass like we use when we're in school with children. But it's a gigantic compass that's used for by st stonemasons, so they can measure a st and work measuring. So there's this relationship with architecture that continues metaphorically in a great deal of your work. Well, to now take this idea of it being made for stone, and then plunge it into something soft like this. Mm, mm. Isn't it exciting? Mm. The hard with the soft piercing, like knives into threads or hair mm. or flesh. Huh? It's something that that is some thinking of materials. I work with all kinds of materials, hard and soft. And when you work with hard and soft at the same time, it's quite amazing. You also told me for the first time that your family had a link to psychoanalysis. Was it your brother? Not only a link, the complete life involvement. A complete life involvement with um, the, he was president of the Society of Psychoanalysis for Chicago. The Freudian Institute. The Freudian Institute in Chicago. And so... Um, so he has an interpretation to all the work I was doing that really led me to think much broader and deeper than just the superficial way that artists work after they make a few red lines and a few blue. Uh... So that's interesting because I didn't, I didn't pursue it with you when you just mentioned it for the first time in our conversation mm -hmm. just before we began this broadcast. But in fact, that is interesting that you had. Well, he would say you had me, discussions with a professional psychoanalyst about all, all the time pieces. because he would say, "Well, what's causing you to go into this very aggressive um, attack?" 
of this very gentle, soft domain. Why is it you feel like you want to when you, it. <laughs> why, why you while you're peacefully in your studio? Why would you want to take these needles and put them into this material like this? Because it's really kind of frightening. And I say, I don't know, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of stabilizing. Stabilizing in what way? Well, it's sort of like hard meets soft and they can both survive and cohabitate. Mm. Ah, that means men and women can do it too. De temps en temps. <laughs> and so then that would be the next conversation. Well, which one is the man and which one is the woman, the hard and soft? And he would help me to find out that it could be interchangeable. That's very interesting. Of who is the soft voice and who is the hard voice? Mm. And how do they find each other? Mm. So, but this, 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 when you said before, in fact, you live between Paris and New York, these conversations were not happening in Paris. No, he was, in, he, was, he was practicing in Chicago. Maybe I'll put this. Hmm. And I was, I've lived here now for 55 years. But you would, you would commute back we to were, America? No, but we were in constant contact. Oh, I see. We were in constant contact. He was, um, as now, I speak every day to people. Mm. With, I'm in, with whom I'm in constant contact. I have like 10 o'clock p.m. rendezvous on the telephone daily. Mm. Mm. And uh, I, I'm not just cut off here in Paris. I'm not isolated. And I'm speaking to Guatemala. I'm speaking to New York. Like your father speaking used to, to do when you were a child. Yes. <laughs> speaking all over the world. Peacefully and and carrying on a, a, a conversation that has some kind of continuity too, building on ideas that we both want to. Maybe I'll read this passage now because I'm looking while you're speaking and thinking not just about geography but color because color is a non linguistic thing we all have in common that is something that makes your work joyously accessible but so transcending but, language. But color, don't forget, has tremendously different associations for different cultures that's absolutely true yes and so you you probably also in morocco and in all sorts of other places you became acquainted with different languages of color well and also the nonos the things that really cause people to be upset frightened mm. frightened or or it puts them at ease mm. if you go to togo and you're going to do something that's in a very big public meeting space you know that color is welcomed other places you go you know that color might be troubling yes so it's not it's really an advantage to have a brother who's a psycho Mm. Analyst, <laughs> but nonetheless, the passage I was going to read, I don't think I will read. I think it will take up a little bit too long. But it's about your encounter with Albers and then Annie, of course. But the encounter with Albers was important because when you mentioned that you had the scholarship um, to um, Santiago, you actually taught his course. Well, I got there you? and I checked into the office and they told me, here's your mission. This is your mission. Mm -hmm. we have, your mission is to go and teach the color and basic design course that you learned at Yale to the architects at the Universidad Católica, the, the young students mm -hmm. there. I went to report for duty, walked into the class, and they told me it was to be in Spanish, of course. Oh, yes. So you had to suddenly teach it in Spanish as well. And I looked in the room, and I was the only woman in the room. How delightful. With 200 young. 200? 200 young Chileans. Not like the causal. And I really <laughs> got a big kick out of going to Chile last summer, which was their winter, giving a lecture at the Universidad Católica. Mm. Took my two granddaughters with me. And after the lecture, men in wheelchairs and with canes hobbled up to say hello and say, look on their cell phones. I was one of your students. Oh, well, I mean, these are, we're looking like old guys. And I thought, <laughs> I don't realize my, I refuse to realize my age. As you should. And since I refuse, I was wondering, 
where are all these little guys coming from? They said, well, we were your students in that class you were teaching <laughs> where you told us to do the exercise five times, you know. So and, you, but you did now, it verbatim. You did, the, you did give them the Albers course. I gave them the whole basic two and three dimensional design course that I had learned and the color course. They would send their cars to the hotel where I was staying mm -hmm. and make it. And I brought my granddaughters with me. And then they'd drive or have their chauffeurs drive in Santiago to show me the buildings they have constructed, like the skyscrapers that they have constructed <laughs> in Santiago in the very chic, nice, beautiful, next to the whole embassy row and downtown municipal and out in the suburbs of Chile. And I was thinking, these guys are just showing off. They're showing me that I'm still doing these little textiles and they've been constructing these mammoths. These, you know, they've constructed the whole skyline, <laughs> the whole skyline of Santiago. Little did they know, Sheila, the immense and ubiquitous <laughs> output of your life since no, 1959. They, they still see me making these little weavings and telling them now, can you do it again? And yes. do it upside down and try to But I'm it. sure you were very, very important for them. And in, in Espanol, on, on truth. Yes. And so you had encounters in, well, you had, you had encounters with all sorts of wonderful people in your life didn't you and you had all sorts of moments like you you, you almost thought at a certain moment before you won a did you win a scholarship to paris before you won that you were going to stay forever when I, I didn't have any idea i didn't want to come to paris i mean paris is a very intimidating place mm. for americans imagine not even speaking french mm. and my and there was a french professor at yale who invited me for lunch and he said your teacher albers told me what you did in chile I'm prepared to give you a grant to go to France when you graduate with your master's in, in the spring. Um, what for? He said, well, you know, mademoiselle, you will never be a truly cultivated woman until you know La France. He was French or not? Definitely, he was a French teacher at Yale. I see, yes. He was the director of the Romance Language Department at Yale. And I left that lunch thinking, boy, oh boy, this guy's really full of himself. I mean, do I really have to go to France and do I really have to become a truly cultivated woman? <laughs> <laughs> two separate, two separate propositions. But they gave, they gave me this grant and out of curiosity, I came. And guess where I am still? Yeah, you're still there. <laughs> but, but With a few side trips. But you had very interesting connections with people connected to the surrealist movement in France. And I mean, this was a cosmopolitan capital full of people of all nations as well. well. It wasn't just the terrible French. to come to France and not speak French. That's true. Oh, and to be an American with de Gaulle presiding. That's when true. When de Gaulle would be telling us, go home Americans every five minutes, get rid of the Americans, get rid of all the NATO, get rid of all the, you know, he had a really running battle with the... So we um, must tell you two things that in May 68, just when everything was happening, from the middle of May to the middle of June, Sheila Hicks's first, well, no, it was with Warren Platner, wasn't it? An important exhibition at the American Cultural Center. That's where you're, that's where you're, if you don't mind my saying. No, 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 I'm making a mistake because you're on two different bits. No, no, this is good, but I would like to point out, mm. because I don't like to always be like the victim of the woman who gets invited by the man to make a show. This is not the case. The I never, I never. No, but imagine the Soviet Tauber. Soviet. We had. A, we're having a very funny extended conversation about Sophie Tauber Arp. Hans and Hans Arp, her husband. Mm. So what happened is the American. There's a woman Baltrusaitis, Ellen Baltrusaitis, who invited me to do a show over on Rue Dragon. Mm. And I was thinking nobody's going to take my work uh, seriously because it's just these little things, mm -hmm. you know, like these little things, you know. How can I flesh it out and make it like a little more substantial? Substantial. And there was this guy who was an architect who was in my studio who was asking me to work on the Ford Foundation in New York. And I said, you do furniture. Yeah, okay, Ken, why don't we put your furniture designs in my little textile show? That's, that's how <laughs> that he, sounds good. And that's how he got in that show. That sounds good. Why don't you put your furniture designs in my little text picture? But this was in May 68, and then you went off. And Sergeant were... Shriver inaugurated the show. Who? Sergeant Shriver. 
You don't know who that oh, is? No, I don't. That was Kennedy's brother-in-law. Oh, gosh. How very impressive. He arrived that week to United, you know, from the United States to Paris to be the new American ambassador. How important. And so the embassy were trying to figure out how to fill up his calendar. And they sent him over to the Rue Dragon in the basement to inaugurate this little exhibition of these Americans. He went over and he started to give a speech and there was a blackout. It was 1968. Everything went into electrical total blackout. So they handed him a flashlight and he stood there with a flashlight in 1968 giving a speech. How marvelous. And then you drove to Prague and you were there in 68 in the autumn in Prague for another exhibition. You had to drive by yourself. Well, no, I had two people helping me. Yes, but I mean, you drove, you we drove. drove uh, we rented a car and drove the exhibition over to Prague because all the transport companies were in the custom. Everybody thing was closed. 1968 was a lockdown. Yeah, lockdown. And so before we get onto this lockdown, because you showed me your very interesting sketchbook about what you've been doing in this lockdown, just to say that talking about 68 in Prague, it's impossible not to talk about politics. And when I was working um, a few years ago, um, on the longer version for the Alison Jakes uh, thing that never got published. I was so interested in your fête de fille in Mont Rouge, in the communist suburb of Mont Rouge, and these things you did, which you now call laundry pieces, where you used babies. Montreuil. Montreuil. Montreuil, not Mont but they were still communist suburbs. You're absolutely you got, you right. Just, I'm a little bit post brandy. Rouge. I'm a little no, bit. Mont Rouge would be, I finished my brandy. Mont Rouge, she would, be more, Mont Rouge would be more communist. Yes, but Montreuil is pretty good. You did all these things which were in a certain ambiance, which has not really um, been noted much in your literature, which I find very interesting. It's also a moment when Seth Siegelau was amazingly well, enough knocking you know, around in the people French are suburbs. Not, uh, people are not interested in, uh, at a certain period, people are not, in, not all at once. People are interested in politics, social implications, ethnic questions. In other periods, you know, different chapters, other things come to the fore. Indeed. Um, when I was trying to make statements that had to do with inclusion of different social milieus and different religions and working in places like Islamic cultures, and um, uh, it was a very selective audience who were tuned in to social uh, awareness. But it was a voice in the wilderness somehow. Mm. Now, everyone's moving in that direction. Thank God. That's great. And let's hope it keeps going that way. Mm. Um, you but can't but one, one must point out that when there were things like the big Lausanne tapestry biennales, the very definition of tapestry was it you made a joke today about Marie Coutoli coming into your studio and saying that's not tapestry, which well, is something you, you... It was actually in, uh, actually she had a television camera rolling, oh, really? rolling in Lausanne. She was being interviewed by the press in Lausanne at the Lausanne Biennale de Tapisserie. The great, the grand dame of tapestry at the time. When uh, people like Marina Abakanovich and even old Bauhaus ladies were involved in this big festival, one must say. And then go on with the story. Well, she do, and she, well, of course, we had Prasinos, we had Lursa, and we had uh, Lursa, of all course. Of the, all of the great tapestry guys. Car uh, all of the great artists who had been woven by Aubisson and Gobelin and Beauvais. Huh? And I was doing things very much like I showed you a minute ago of the little, of the sort of three dimensional sculptural things. And television camera was covering the opening, the vernissage of the exhibition. And this a woman with five or six medals on the poitrine and television cameras following her were making the rounds of the show. And she came up to me and she said, Mademoiselle, um, il paraît, yeah, I'm told that you are showing a tapestry here in this exhibition. And I looked at her, I thought this is a loaded question, right? And I turned around and I thought, I'm not going to open my mouth. But I showed her and just made a gesture of what I was showing. Look behind me. And then she turned, also doing the same kind of gesture to the television cameras. And she said, moi, je ne vois pas une tapisserie. <laughs> I see no tapestry here. 
So I was thinking, <laughs> okay, are we going to continue this dialogue? Then I met her on other occasions. She would say to me, you know, say très mignon, la chose que tu fais. It's very cute what you do. But you know, it's really not tapestry. I mean, like, when are you going to get with it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so now I would like to tell you, next week I'm going over to Gobelin and we're going to start making tapestries. Are you going to actually make real tapestries yeah. for the first time? Love Ray. Love Ray. Not like the one that Brigitte Macron has already selected. No, it's not Ray. We're going to, I think we're going to do tapestry and tapis. Not, and carpet. So the tapis would be knotted. Take threads and knot them. Huh? Mm -hmm. Like this, hmm? knotted, so they have a pile. Mm -hmm. And then take other threads and weave them and make mm -hmm. it a flat mm -hmm. warp and weft classic tapestry. Uh, I have nothing against that. It's another challenge. Mm -hmm. And I do like <laughs> to cross threads mm -hmm. and work with threads because it's lines. How do you make, how do you write poetry? You write poetry with lines. Yes. And yes. words and words. And are... all this lovely wire. I mean, there are lines everywhere. It's very interesting, your, not avant-gardism, but your, um, your unusualness and your originality versus these classic elements of color, line, form, circles, squares. Ambiance. Ambiance. Um, very, very interesting. Who was the French singer who talked about ambiance? I can't remember. I don't know if it was Edith Piaf. It was something like that. Yes, ambiance. Um, in fact, we've never talked together about music. But, well, uh, you know, people, we can't talk about art. How can you talk about music? You have to listen to music. Indeed. So we're not going to talk about music. But I mean, music, people think they're going to sit around and talk about music. Like, like what we're doing, we're in visual arts. I'm in visual arts. You we know, are. Plasticien. Are we going to sit around and talk about it? No. No, we aren't. <laughs> we're going to look at it. But the thing is that I do love your written work. I do think your photography should be looked at. Um, I have been discussing with Sheila how lovely it would be to edit her notebooks in the way that some other people's notebooks have been edited recently. And maybe your favorite, um, isn't it this guy is Venezuelan, your Juan guy. Where has he gone? He's disappeared again. Um, this man, Luis, 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 Perez, Luis Perez, he seems to me the person who would be so perfect to edit and to understand the geographies you're talking about and the sights and the smells you're talking about. And this relationship between the surface of the texture and the visuals and the, and the, the, the textures of the work you make and what they represent including for you as memory devices, because we haven't talked about quipus yet. Uh, these funny knots that are the first, um, the early forms of counting, which are like memory devices. There's a way in which... Abacus. abacus. Yes, there's, there's a Proust thing. Even your, maybe now is the time just to talk very briefly, because we've been going very well about um, your period of seclusion here. And look at your, your brass. <laughs> Can we have your notebook? because um, Sheila um, said she, she locked down on March the 17th and only started reopening this atelier in June. And she's been taking notes and making images and thinking about things, of course, every day. Oh, these were what I found so extraordinary. Um, bras of better days. Uh, these are hanging like quipuses as well, frankly, aren't they? Bras of better days. We've had a little bra conversation. But I must just point uh, out know, to everybody. The, back, the background of that is, yes. it seemed like the good time to clean out my closet upstairs. Oh, you're not the only one there. Okay, so <laughs> I, I took out of all these things out of my closet and I put them all on uh, one big uh, table. And I started looking at the bras. The bras are very funny because they, they accommodate volume. Yes. They're not just flat textiles like a skirt. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, so they're all voluminous and they seem to twist and they seem to move and they seem to have all kinds of front, back and middle. And and front. memories, presumably. So, you know, start thinking of volumen, volumes. And what can, uh, painters and sculptors, now sculptors think of volumes. Exactly, but one must point out that there is a kind of epigraph to the whole notebook, 
which was not done with any anyone reading it to this audience in sight. And it is from Gropius from the Bauhaus 1919. And it does say there is no difference between the artist and the artisan craftsman. The artist is an exalted craftsman. And that's obviously something that's very important for you. And what I was thinking as well. Was I don't that like art that's poorly made. No, because you're a brilliant craftsman. And <laughs> but I was thinking of the fact that one thing you didn't mention about this place, the Cour de Rouen, is that outside is the very famous restaurant called the Picpus, because you said this was the place of the invention of the guillotine, but it's also where the French Revolution was hatched. And what I like is the fact that David was not only the painter of the revolution, but what was called the Ordonnateur des Fêtes, the person who organized all the fates. And there's a, there's a very interesting relationship there, not just between artist and craftsman, but between revolutionary, the revolutionary and the person who organized celebrations. And I think that that's, I think, even though you said that you don't like vernissage, we laughed about the fact that sometimes I confess I do like, I do like to go to openings and I'm see a big party friends. girl. I have a big you party girl. You are a big party girl I as well. I confess I'm a big party Well, girl. you really so. have made the most extraordinary fate. And I think that Sheila has offered us a celebration as well this evening, don't you? We didn't know how our conversation would go, but it's been extraordinarily wide range. I, Sheila. I, I don't go anywhere, Sheila, for a minute, please. I just want to say this is the most amazing experience. Unfortunately, we're nearly coming up to, oh my God, look. Um, I, I just want to say how wonderful it is. And we've had nearly an hour, which is heartbreaking because there's a lot. And I must say, that this Zoom thing that has driven us mad, this is the most amazing opportunity to have an intimate, close, intelligent, funny experience. And all of us here are able to have it. It's not like being in an audience where you're at the back. We're here with you both talking so closely, looking at us closely. It's incredible. And I'm amazingly grateful to you, Sheila, for being so open and Sarah for being so helpful and helping reveal so i just want to say how bloody amazing it's been and i all of us want to thank you so much and it's been unusual zoom wins suddenly it's an amateur spontan amateur spontaneity it's brilliant what a great format let's so go revolutionary and celebratory show. totally brilliant thank, thank you everybody. so much both of you thank, thank you. you goodbye Bye, everybody, everybody. Long live Paris. Bye. Bye. Okay, we did it.